Hello everyone, today's lesson is going to be on Lord of the Flies chapter 12. Please make sure that you've read through chapter 12 before we work through these slides. A few of the things that we're going to be looking at is just an overall recap of things that have happened, a summary of chapter 12, key quotations and some analysis of uh, sections from this chapter, and a writing task at the end. So, quick summary of what's happened so far. Um, chapter 10, we know that Ralph and Piggy are thinking about Simon's death and are perhaps uh, shirking the blame slightly, um, denying that they had anything to do with it. This is quite interesting and make sure that you've really had a thought about why that is they do though. Jack sets up camp on Castle Rock and the tribe attacks Ralph and the others. At the end of the chapter, Piggy's glasses are stolen by Jack. So again, remember that um, fire is a key theme, um, a key image that's used throughout the whole of the um, novel. Things to remember about chapter 11. So Ralph and the three boys visit Jack, try to reason with him, but Ralph does end up challenging him. Roger sends down a rock that kills Piggy. So I'm sure you've looked at that, but it might be worth having another look because the character of Roger is incredibly important. Sam and Eric are captured and the tribe then attack Ralph. Ralph. We now know that Ralph is alone. Jack tries to hunt Ralph down and there's quite a lot of um, description about that. The forest is set on fire and Ralph is chased to the beach. So have a think about other things that have happened on the beach and why it's so significant that they um, get Ralph to that point. Um, because the forest is set um, on fire, the smoke is going to be rather large. So um, a naval officer appears on the beach. We're going to be looking at this in a bit more detail, but this interaction between Ralph and um, the naval officer is particularly interesting, as the officer initially thinks that the boys have been playing games. The boys are rescued, we assume, because um, the naval officer does have a boat and is there to get the boys on the boat. Uh, Ralph breaks down in tears, as do the other boys, and the novel ends with the officer looking quite embarrassed, unable to cope with the very un-British display of emotions. So there's that stiff upper lip Britishness kind of thing going on there. So these are the um, quotations or sections that we're going to be looking at. We're not going to look at all of them. Um, these are just things for you to note down. Again, the page numbers that I have might be slightly different to the page numbers that you have, so bear that in mind. The first quotation that we're going to look at is, this was a savage whose image refused to blend with the ancient picture of a boy in shorts and shirt. So the key parts that I've picked out, again, you can choose different ones. The first one was, was the savage whose image refused to blend. So I've um, looked at the use of the um, indefinite article A instead of the um, to describe the savage, because it suggests that perhaps this savage, a savage, is more of a general idea rather than a particular thing. So essentially, the boys have been reduced to the ideas of themselves or ideas of a savage um, because they are so changed. The use of the past tense verb refused is also interesting as it demonstrates how far from what they once were um, and that perhaps they will never go back to the way they were. They will never go back to normal. The second part that I've looked at is ancient picture of a boy in shorts and shirt. The use of the adjective ancient, I think is quite um, interesting as it has connotations of things and civilizations that are long, long ago and far removed. And um, the image of the boy in a shirt creates this imagery of an innocent young schoolboy playing. And um, as this picture is ancient, the memory of what the boy once was is perhaps inconceivable with the image that's presented in the boy now. Um, it's unfathomable that these two boys would be the same person. So again, think about why Golding's doing that. Why is Golding drawing attention to the fact that these boys are so changed in both looks but also in personality as well? 
The next quotation is one that I'd like you to have a little think about. So I think this is a really interesting quotation in that it's talking about the pig skull, the Lord of the Flies. So the quotation is when he saw something standing in the centre, but then he saw that the white face was bone and that the pig's skull grinned at him from the top of a stick. We know this is Ralph seeing this. So have a think about what the connotations of the colour white are. Why would a skull be described as a face initially? They're quite dissimilar. Um, was Ralph expecting to see something? How do you know? Um, also think about the effect of the skull grinning at Ralph. How long does it take for a face to decompose? I mean, that's quite an awful image to think about. But again, how long does it, how long has that pig skull been there? Um, what might Ralph's mental state be? Bear in mind, Ra um, not Ralph, Simon is the one that spoke to or thought that he spoke to Lord of the Flies. So has he come to terms with this idea that it is living within each of them? Is this why he might be able to see the skull grinning at him? So take some time to have a little think about that. Again, consider Golding's purpose, Golding's intention. Um, as well as alternative interpretations. What I am noticing in the work that I've marked so far for my class is that we're still not extending our analysis in enough detail. Make sure that it's crystal clear what you think and why. OK, so uh, statements that are quite vague, we don't want to see in our analysis. We want really specific analysis. The next section we're going to look at is a longer section. So um, I've given you the page numbers. Um, we're going to go through this together because it is quite long. and I want you to note down some key things. So you'll see in the uh, in black, I've put a couple of key quotations that I want you to either highlight, note down, because I feel they are really important. So if we go from the top of the page at length, they bent forward and peered in his face. So remember, this is the section where Ralph has come upon um, Sam and Eric and he's wanting to know what's going on. We thought it was, we didn't know it what it was. We thought, so again, remember, Sam and Eric kind of talk in unison and the use of the dash to kind of explain that. Memory of their new and shameful loyalty came to them. Eric was silent, but Sam tried to do his duty. You got to go, Ralph. You go away now. He wagged his spear and essayed fierceness. You shove off, see? Eric nodded agreement and jabbed his spear in the air. Ralph leaned on his arm and did not go. I came to see you two. His voice was thick. His throat was hurting him now, though it had received no wounds. I came to see you two. So again, notice there that he says, I came to see you two twice. Why might he be doing that? Words could not express the dull pain of these things. He fell silent while the vivid stars were split, spilt and danced all ways. Sam shifted uneasily. Honest, Ralph, you'd better go. Ralph looked up at him. You two aren't painted. How can you, if it were light, if it were light, shame would burn them at admitting these things. But the night was dark. Eric took up and then the twins started their um, antiphonal speech. You got to go because it's not safe. They made us. They hurt us. Who? Jack? Oh no. So notice there it's not Jack that's doing the hurting. Again, does Jack being the leader need to essentially do any of his dirty work now? No, because he's got minions to help him. They bent to him and lowered their voices. Push off, Ralph. It's a tribe. They made us. We couldn't help it. When Ralph spoke again, his voice was low and seemed breathless. What have I done? I liked him and I wanted us to be rescued. Again, the stars spilled about the sky. Eric shook his head earnestly. Listen, Ralph, never mind what sense. That's gone. So that's a key quotation I want you to pick out. So never mind what sense. That's gone. Essentially saying that all sense has gone. Why might Eric be saying that? What is it that Jack and his tribe are doing that doesn't doesn't make sense? 
Is it the whole situation? Why they're being forced to do it or why they're letting themselves be forced to do it? Never mind about the chief. You've got to go for now for your own good. The chief and Roger, yes, Roger, they hate you, Ralph. They're going to do you. They're going to hunt you tomorrow. But why? I don't know. And Ralph, Jack and the chief, so Jack the chief says it will be dangerous and we've got to be careful and throw our spears like at a pig. We're going to spread out in a line across the island. We're going forward from this end until we find you. So the boys are essentially giving Ralph the heads up about what's going to happen. And notice that Jack is the one that's ordering all of these things to happen, but perhaps not necessarily doing the deed himself. We've got to give signals like this. Eric raised, raised his mouth and achieved a faint ululation by beating out on his open mouth. Then he glanced behind him nervously. Like that, only louder, of course. But I've done nothing, whispered Ralph urgently. I only wanted to keep up a fire. He paused for a moment, thinking miserably of the morrow. A matter of overwhelming importance occurred to him. What are you? He could not bring himself to be specific at first, but then fear and loneliness goaded him. When they find me, what are they going to do? The twins were silent. Beneath him, the death rock flowered again. So I think this quotation is really um, significant with regards to the death rock. So notice how whenever we talk about Roger, he's always got some kind of rock near him um, or stone, something like that. But notice that the rock is being called death rock because this is the rock, presumably, that killed Piggy. And then notice the use of the word flowered again. Think of what things do if they flower. If, a, um, if something flowers, it perhaps becomes more beautiful or it becomes awake something like that so again have a think about why the word flowered is being used to describe this death rock last few bits what are they oh god i'm hungry the towering rock seemed to sway under him well what the twins answered his question indirectly you got to go now ralph for your own good keep away as far as you can won't you come with me? Three of us, we'd stand a chance. After a moment's silence, Stam spoke in a strangled voice. You don't know Roger. He's a terror. So again, that's the last bit that I want to focus on. You don't know Roger. He's a terror. So the fact that they don't want to leave because they are afraid of what Roger would do to them really shows you what an awful tyrant Roger is. Somebody that's incredibly sadistic. So it doesn't seem to have any sense of um, morality or consequence for his actions. He's perhaps the most the scariest character in the whole of the novel, but also the whole of humanity. Um, OK, so we're going to look at the section. So the next quotation is he staggered to his feet. This is at the end of the um, chapter. He staggered to his feet, tensed for more terrors, and looked up at a huge peaked cap. It was a white-topped cap, and above the green shade of the peak was a crown, an anchor gold foliage. He saw white drill epaulets, a revolver, a row of gilt buttons down the front of a uniform. So looking at the uh, analysis that I've given you, Golding spends an awful lot of time describing this particular um, image. So the first thing I've picked out is huge peaked cap. So initially we don't really know what it is that Ralph is looking at. So the use of the adjective obviously is used to describe how big it is, um, but perhaps it is an exaggeration. So the boys haven't seen adults or big people in quite a long time. So this image of an adult look it would would look huge would look big but also ralph is probably is he's staggered he's staggering to his feet so therefore he is quite low down so again this would make um the officer's cap look rather large um at first it's not clear is it a cap of a mountain or is it the cap of a hat then it does make it quite clear when it's this white topped hat uh, cap 
The next thing I want to look at is the use of the symbol, the crown and anchor in gold foliage. So it clearly refers to the Royal Navy and the boys would definitely have understood this. Bearing in mind, all of the boys are from private school, schools that require a sum of money, um, and presumably their fathers would either be in the Navy, but would be aware of that. So the boys would have come into contact, whether through a picture or seeing physically a Royal Navy uniform, uh, they would know what this is. And it's also quite clear for the reader um, that this is someone who's come to rescue the boys and perhaps a sense of hope is present. Um, the next few words, drill, epaulets and revolver, roll of gilt buttons. Again, they reference to particular aspects of the uniform. Um, so Golding spends a lot of time describing this. I want you to think back to the description of Jack in chapter one, his choir boys where he is explaining what it is they look like and how ridiculous they look because of the uh, heat of the island. The last thing I want you to think about is the use of the word uniform, just to make it crystal clear that this is some person in the uniform. So it brings hope and safety to the boys as well as the reader, because we associate uniforms with order, institutions, something that the boys have been lacking. And that as a society, we do cling to uniforms for meaning, for belonging, but also perhaps for restrictions too. That's something to think about, especially as the boys enter the island in a uniform and they leave with a uniformed officer, but all bedraggled and um, completely changed. Uh, this is more of an optional task for you. So the character of Roger is incredibly important um, and his development or um, the fact that he's able to show perhaps his true colours really comes out in this last chapter. So consider how he's changed and with a lack of authority and control, he's able to perhaps run wild with his desire to harm and kill. So it would be a good idea to create a quotation bank for this character. I would select quotations from the, the whole of the novel that shows how he's slowly descending into his savagery and primal desires. The next thing we're going to look at is the interaction of the officer and Ralph. So I'd like you to turn to page 214. So we're going to start from the beginning when he says hello. Um, and if these are a few key quotations that I'd like you to pick out too. Again, it's really interesting to see how he interacts with, um, with Ralph, but also how very British he appears and how controlled and calm he is. In the face of, as he says, these little scarecrows that look a bit like monsters. Hello? Squirming a little, conscious of his filthy appearance, Ralph answered shyly. Hello. The officer nodded as if a question had been answered. Are there any adults, any grown-ups with you? Dumbly, Ralph shook his head. He turned a half pace on the sand, a semicircle of little boys, their bodies streaked with coloured clay, sharp sticks in their hands, were standing on the beach, making no noise at all. So notice there how the boys are referred to as little boys, but they've got clay on their um, bodies and they're holding sharp sticks. So previously that would have been described slightly uh, more menacingly, but again, this is told through the eyes of the officer. Fun games, said the officer. The fire reached the coconut palms by the beach and swallowed them noisily. A flame, seemingly detached, swung like an acrobat and licked up the palm heads of, on the platform. The sky was black. The officer grinned cheerfully at Ralph. We saw your smoke. What have you been doing? Having a war or something? So the use of the questions to Ralph, perhaps at first are quite overwhelming to him, not having had interaction like this in quite some time, but the use of the simple sentences in the, um, one after the other perhaps suggests or shows that the officer isn't expecting um, Ralph to either answer, maybe he's saying them rhetorically or he's only expecting a short reply. Ralph nodded. The officer inspected the little scarecrow in front of him. 
the kid needed a bath, a haircut, a nose wipe and a good deal of ointment. So I find this quotation really important because, again, Ralph is being um, uh, not necessarily belittled, but he's been described as a little scarecrow before. You know, Ralph is one of the bigger boys and he is described with respect. But reducing him to a scarecrow is perhaps quite comic and, again, shows you how the officer probably views them. And the fact that he uses the word kid, I mean, kid is quite an American way of saying child or boy or girl. But again, kid, it, it's putting him back where he belongs in the kind of not social hierarchy. It's nothing to do with social, but in you know the age brackets, he is a kid. He's not a tribes person. He's not a leader. He's a kid. And the fact that you have this list of things that he needs to have done to him to make him look respectable is also really important. Nobody killed, I hope. Any dead bodies? Again, the um, officer is using the same uh, kind of wording, the same um, rhetorical questions. And he really doesn't think that Ralph is going to reply. So when Ralph replies only two and they've gone, the officer leaned down and looked closely at Ralph, two killed. Ralph nodded again. So you can tell that the officer's really shocked here. And behind him, the whole island was shuddering with flame. The officer knew, as a rule, when people were telling the truth, he whistled softly. So again, look at this. He whistled softly. The, this boy has essentially told him that two young boys have been killed by other boys. And the adult, the person that should be um, there to the disciplinarian, somebody to look after the boys, is simply sh shooing it under the carpet, whistling softly, pretending he didn't say anything. So what might Golding be saying here about human beings, about the, the British, perhaps? Um, other boys were appearing now, tiny tots, some of them, brown with the dis um, descended bellies of small savages. One of them came close to the officer and looked up. I'm, I'm there was no more to come. Per Percival Wims Madison sought in his head for an incantation that had faded clean away. The officer turned back to Ralph. We'll take you off. How many of you are there? Ralph shook his head. The officer looked past him to the group of painted boys. Who's boss here? I am, said Ralph loudly. A little boy who wore the remains of an extraordinary black cap on his red hair and who carried the remains of a pair of spectacles at his waist, started forward, then changed his mind and stood still. We saw your smoke, and you don't know how many of you are there? No, sir, I should have thought, said the officer, as he visualised the search before him. I should have thought that a pack of British boys, you're all British, aren't you, would have been able to put up a better show than that, I mean. So, remember, Piggy is the one that throughout the whole thing wants to make sure that they've got a fire going, wants to make sure that they know who they've got so that they can almost like a register. So the fact that Piggy is now gone and Piggy was unable to collate, collect this um, uniform demonstrates a lack of perhaps logic and responsibility. It was like that at first, said Piggy, before things, he stopped. We were together then. The officer nodded helpfully. I know, jolly good show, like Coral Island. Again, he's not listening. He's not listening to Ralph. Ralph looked at him dumbly. For a moment, he had a fleeting picture of the strange glamour that had once infested the beaches. But the island was scorched like dead wood. Simon was dead and Jack had... The tears began to flow and sobs shook him. So perhaps here... Ralph's realising just what has happened. This is not a game. Not that he thought it was a game, but that the reality of the situation has really hit home. He gave himself up to them now for the first time on the island. Great shuddering spasms of grief that seemed to wrench his whole body. His voice rose under the black smoke before the burning wreckage of the island and, in, and infected by that emotion. The other li little boys began to shake and sob too. 
So again, um, they are looking to Ralph for example, looking to Ralph as he's perhaps their role model, um, and they too are, are upset. I think that's particularly interesting. Again, the officer, it's, you know, why does it matter that they're British? Because you're all British, aren't you? And he expects more from um, the British um, because British are the best, as they've said in the novel before. You to look at and this is something I want you to do independently and I would like you to send this to either me or your um, my class and Miss Petrie or Miss Main for the other top set. So the writing task is to use the quotation to write two analytical paragraphs considering how the character of Ralph has developed and changed throughout the novel. So the quotation is essentially the last line, Ralph wept the end of innocence darkness of man's heart and a fall through the air of the true wise old friend called Piggy. So I personally would look at you know the use of innocence and darkness and fall through the air. I think that's particularly um, interesting as well. Okay.